right. Well, let's let's dive in. Um, our green room chatter was all already like very full of information. So I will kick us off and welcome each of you to say thank you for being here. Again, thrilled to have your presence on today's episode of the nonprofit show. Jeffrey Glazer is here with us. Jeffrey is an attorney, and he is going to share with us some top five legal issues that we all need to know about within our nonprofit organization. But Jeff, before we dive into conversation with you, we of course want to make sure our guests know that who we are, Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and we are so honored to have the continued support of our presenting sponsors. Thank you so very much to Bloomering, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, the Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as Staffing Boutique. I like to remind everyone that these companies exist to help you do more good in, around, throughout your community. They are here to lean into you and your mission. Please do check them out, but not until after our show because Jeff has a lot to share. <laughs> and then we also wanna make sure that if you have missed any of our episodes or you wanna go back and listen, Julie, I was hearing from someone the other day that the nonprofit show has become the new Netflix like binge series. And so <laughs> people are binging on the nonprofit show, but you can find us on Roku, YouTube, <laughs> Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. But wait, there's more. The Sham Wow is here with, <laughs> with a podcast series. So again, we have bifurcated these series into not only our webcast, this is uh, this will remain, but also into podcast form. So wherever you stream your podcast, make sure that you tell Siri in your smartphone to queue up the nonprofit show and we will be right there with you. And today, honored again, Jeff, to have you here, an attorney with Odgen. That's really hard for me to say. Odgen, Glazer, and Schaefer. Is that correct? That's right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your nonprofit background, in particular within your professional realm as being an attorney? For sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, our attorney or our, our law firm does business transactional work. So we do a lot of work with getting organizations set up with uh, working on a lot of contracts and sort of relationships of businesses with other businesses. And a large part of the work that we do is related to socially good organizations. More generally, I'll put nonprofits as sort of a subset of socially good organizations. And a lot of what we'll talk about today is sort of that overlap between sort of the for-profit universe and the nonprofit profit universe and when and why things get a little weird as soon as you ask the IRS for tax status, right? But, <laughs> but really kind of highlighting how running a for-profit business isn't that different from running a nonprofit business or stated vice versa, stated in the alternative. Running a nonprofit isn't all that different from running any other kind of business. And um, a lot of the legal issues that we see on the nonprofit side are similar to the same kinds of legal issues that we're going to see on the for-profit side of things. So I love that you started us out that way. Um, and maybe that is like your number one message. I mean, we... Yeah. We champion that concept a lot, but Jeffrey, I've got to tell you, it's such a foreign thought to so many folks managing nonprofits, serving on the boards, doing the programming, even funding. And so what a great way to start this off because those can quickly become legal issues, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when we're, you know, when we're talking about lawyers, right, the role of lawyers in the organization, generally, you know, we're, we're talking about relationships and it's relationships with outside entities, but also internal relationships, right? The, the relationship of the directors to the officers or the officers to the, to the volunteers or the organization to its donors. And when you, break down these relationships, it turns out that they're very similar to the relationships that you have in a for-profit business or really any other kind of entity that, or any other kind of dealing um, that you might have, right? In a, in a for-profit and in a non-profit organization, you have to think about 
What's the purpose of what you're doing? What is the reason why these people have banded together to accomplish a particular end or to, to accomplish a particular goal? And that goal might have a social purpose, right? It might, might have a purely profit purpose, but I think that's pretty unusual in today's uh, business environment. Even our for-profit organizations often have social yeah. Uh, elements that they're trying to accomplish. Think of something like Patagonia, where they have a very, very uh, strong out, you know, outdoors mission, even though they're a for-profit company. Similarly, you know, you can have nonprofit entities that also have a, an outdoor mission, right? And maybe even accomplish it in similar ways by selling goods or services in order to further that, uh, in order to further that nonprofit mission, that charitable purpose of improving the outdoors or whatever that might be, right? And so what we use, we use legal rules to really help us put in place a framework for things like raising money and perpetuating the organization beyond the people who start it. And those things are no different in the for-profit environment than they are in the nonprofit environment. Yeah, you had said something in our green room chatter, and it is definitely worth repeating, but you're talking about the magic or lack of magic within law. I loved that. Yes, I loved that. hear that with us, if you would, because I really do think that, you know, there's kind of the two camps to, to the legal side when it comes to nonprofit, the formation, mm -hmm. and then the, oh, crap, we mm -hmm. need help. <laughs> You know, and so talk to us about the magic or the pixie dust that may or may not exist. Yeah, I guess, I, you know, I don't believe, I, I don't believe that lawyers are magicians, right? There, there's no magic what? to the law. I know, I know it's crazy. And um, even more than being magicians, I think a lot of times people think that lawyers are sort of these soothsayers or people that stand on top of the mountain and decree what shall be for here and evermore. Um, and if we have a if we have a question about whether something is hashtag legal or not, right? We go ask the lawyer, and they tell us yes, that's legal, or no, that's not legal. And so much of the relationship, not just in the for profit status, but nonprofit as well. Um, is there are rarely yes and no answers, right? This is an ongoing conversation, and it's about risk management and risk mitigation. And it's, um, it's very rarely a yes or no answer, right? People look to lawyers to say, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? When in fact, with what we should be asking isn't necessarily should I do it or shouldn't I do it, but what's the risk of taking this course of action? What's the risk of taking this other course of action? Because then it becomes up to the directors or the officers um, to then finally make that decision. Do we accept this risk or do we not accept this risk? Um, and so in that way, I don't know that lawyers are, are necessarily magicians. People sort of see us as being, um, as sort of being these all knowing omniscient beings um, when in fact, we're, we're really more, uh, it's really more about risk management. Mm -hmm. What you about know, size, sorry, Julia, of the organization know. where, you know, is there more magic needed? And I, now I'm just going to play on the whole magic thing, but for, sure. uh, for, for a larger organization, as opposed to a smaller, like, is there more risk to consider? Um, and, and I'm thinking this in a broad way, like the smaller the organization, perhaps less governance, right? The larger the organization, perhaps a better established governance, but we're also playing with, with bigger partners, with bigger dollars, with bigger contracts. So how does that risk assessment vary depending on the size and scale of an organization? Yeah, I would say by and large, these are um, these are issues of magnitude, not issues of existence, right? In other words, for a, for a large organization and a small organization, both need governance. Right. Yeah. We tend to sort of gloss over that in small organizations because the people tend to know each other and they just tend to act more informally. But I would argue that th that still doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't be having board meetings, that you shouldn't be taking minutes, that you shouldn't be passing resolutions. Right. But the scale and the 
importance is going to change as you get bigger, right? As you get, as you get bigger, the, the number of zeros on the, on the transaction is just going to keep getting added. And once you get a certain number of zeros, the banks like to see official documentation of things, right? Not that you shouldn't have that documentation, even when there aren't any zeros on the transaction, but other parties start requiring documentation, right? Your banks, your other partners, you know, when, when you start adding zeros to the, to the value of the transaction, everybody just wants to take one step back and say, maybe we should put this in writing, or maybe we should have a piece of paper that documents that you're going to do this thing, in a, you know, for me. Um, which isn't to say you shouldn't have those documents at the small transaction side sides. You absolutely should, but maybe you're documenting them through email instead of with a formal signed two-party agreement. Great point. Yeah, that's a good point. It's really interesting. Um, I love so far your framework has been, I, I think, really um, an amazing way for us to rethink things and to put them into perspective because it seems to me so many nonprofits, and Jarrett mentioned this in the green room chatter, is that you know you know you have to get your legal partner with you when you're forming and getting started, and then you oftentimes don't revisit that relationship until you have a problem, and it seems to me that it's really just um, you know just not a good way to structure your operations only reaching back out to those folks when there's a crisis. And I never thought of it until you mentioned it, but I do think we feel that we can go to the attorneys and they're gonna fix it and they're gonna <laughs> tell us what's right and then we can move on. Um, so for your point three, you, you kind of have to rewrite the script for us a little bit about how your attorneys are going to help you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an ongoing conversation with attorneys, and I think I think you make a really good point that that I'd like to highlight, right? Which is that none of these documents that quote the lawyer creates for you are static documents, right? These are going to change over time. I was okay. just meeting with a client last night, and over the last uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing with uh, with some of our nonprofit clients over the last, we'll say, twelve months or so, have been things like reviewing bylaws and articles and making sure that they still match up with how the company works, right? Because to your point, Julia, one of the things that happens is those bylaws just sit there until somebody has a problem with them. And sure. then when you have a problem with them, everybody's all of a sudden like, wait, what do the bylaws say? Why right. does it even say that? We've, we haven't done that in 15 years. Right. Like the number of boards I've sat on where people are like, you know, where are the bylaws? What do they even say? Or, you know, we haven't done that in 10 years. Why does this say this, right? We should be reviewing these. These are living documents, right? This isn't a, I'm going to put my flag in the sand and then this is, this will be and forever shall be how we accomplish this. It's the document should reflect what the practice is. So, you know, it might have started one way when the when when the nonprofit or the entity was was rather small, but over time, as you get more members and the relationship of the membership to the board changes, those documents should be changing too. Your bylaws, you should be reviewing those as a matter of course, just every two to five years, um, and talking with your attorney about is this is this right, right? Is this actually how we work? And it's, it's a conversation, right? Understanding the risks, understanding what it is that the organization currently does, where the points of, of risk are, and then having documents and processes in place that help to mitigate those risks. And so this is an ongoing conversation. Wow. I have this visual of, I know exactly where the bylaws are. They are collecting <laughs> dust on the shelf with the strategic plan, right? Yeah. Like 
those two things are sitting together on the, on the shelf somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's true in every single organization. This sort of goes back to the, the point from the very beginning. This isn't this isn't any different between nonprofits and for-profit organizations, right? right? That I have this exact same conversation with my for-profit clients as I do with my nonprofit clients, but nonprofit clients tend to let it maybe run away from them a little bit longer because everybody's doing other things. Right. For a lot of the board, it's not their primary job to be on the board of this thing. For maybe a lot of officers, it's not even their principal job um, mm -hmm. to be the director of this nonprofit. You know, they might have multiple organizations that they work for or whatever. Um, and so, you know, putting in place just regular practices to revisit. Uh, to revisit these things every so often, right? Every two years, every five years, we just revisit the bylaws, whether we have an issue with them or not, just to make sure that everything matches up with how we actually work. That's great. I love that. And I think it's, it's you know, magical to hear that, that wisdom and mm -hmm. that these documents are malleable and that they need to navigate with you as your mission changes, as your organization grows. Um, I think that's something we lose sight of. And mm -hmm. I agree, Jarrett, we tick those boxes and then we <laughs> we're like, okay, we did that task and we stick it on the shelf and then, you know, we're, we're done. I want to have you kind of talk to us um, about this. You have a really interesting kind of phraseology and you're like doing good does not require nonprofit status, except when it does. Can you share with us what that means? Because I'm fascinated by that. It's such a, a buzzword in the for-profit and the nonprofit world. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about doing good or having a social mission, automatically think, I need to be a nonprofit, right? That's my secret to success. Right. But when we really step back and take a look at what's going on in socially good organizations, what we really see is that doing good is comprised of three basic things, right? It's a, it's a mission, it's accountability, and it's transparency. And not, none of those things require nonprofit status, right? It requires being focused on a particular action that is going to make a particular community or ecosystem better, right? It's holding the people that say they're going to do good for this purpose, uh, holding those people accountable, and then proving to your stakeholders that you're doing it, right? That's our transparency, right? And so it might be in the articles of organ or of incorporation in our bylaws about what our, our mission is is and how we hold each other accountable. It might be in our policies and procedures about publishing reports and uh, providing some sort of benefit statement about how, how we're doing the things. And none of that is either mandated, required, suggested for nonprofit status, although sometimes it is, right? In order to be a nonprofit, you have to have a charitable mission, right? So you have to be explicit about what your mission is. It is. So Jeffrey, you know, when you talk about this and that, that the legal framework and that, and really in, in our nation, you know, we use the IRS through this. Um, how plausible is it that we can have that? I know there's that, that um, B Corp status. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that we can be doing good without that formal structure. But again, is it wise? That's it depends great... on what you're trying to okay. do and how you're trying to do it. Nonprofit status, sometimes you have to have it, right? Sometimes if you, if the primary way that you're going to be financing the good that you're doing is through donations from the public, then having nonprofit status is important, right? But if that's not a major part of your revenue mix, right? If you can make money through selling t-shirts or through private status to do good, 
right? And in fact, for the for the times when you do need nonprofit status, you can be, you don't need to hold it permanently, right? You can be more tactical about it and partner with other people who do have it in a fiscal sponsorship arrangement, right? So that, that way you don't always need the nonprofit status. You, the entity doing good, doesn't have to deal with that sort of administrative overhead. You can just farm that out to somebody that already has nonprofit status and deals regularly with those issues so that you don't have to take on the higher administrative burden. I appreciate that perspective wow. so very much all too often. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to sound horrible when I say this, but all too often I hear, oh, I'm going to start a nonprofit or my friend just started a nonprofit. And I'm thinking, why, <laughs> you know, and again, not to discourage someone, but there exactly. are so many nonprofits in the United yeah. States. Just, I mean, in the U.S., there's so many others around the globe, right, doing charitable good. And for, for what you said, Jeff, really looking at, you know, you can do good and not have to be a, a, a tax identification of a nonprofit. I typically mm -hmm. work with the 501c3s as well as the c6s, mm -hmm. um, but there's so many other organizations and ways to achieve your mission and your your do-goodery, I'm going to, I'm going to claim that phrase, right? Your do-goodery, okay. um, that it doesn't have to be so much the, the nonprofit. Um, so I really appreciate that. And that partnership, the collaboration, like that is just as impactful as having your own program or your own organization with programs. Um, so looking at partnership, I think is critical, uh, one of the things I would like to ask you, and this is probably that golden ticket, right? Like if you find this golden ticket, you're very clearly going in, going into, you know, this, this main event. How do we as nonprofit professionals, leaders, board members, establish a relationship with a nonprofit attorney? Because I really want to you know, we're always looking for, you know, special skill sets on our board. And I really like to say a real estate attorney is not a nonprofit attorney, right? Like we're, we're not going to the podiatrist to check on our eyesight, <laughs> that kind of thing. So could you like, what is the secret sauce to this? Yeah, I think there are three main areas of, of legal issues that come up in the, in the nonprofit universe. Right. The first, um, the first is organizational issues. Right. The writing of bylaws, the writing of articles, the sort of drafting of contracts, kind of stuff. This is all relatively. It, it overlaps relatively nicely with corporate. A more traditional sort of corporate practice is is one. The uh, second major area that tends to come up in the nonprofit context uh, are tax issues, right? A lot, of, uh, a lot of the nonprofit status itself is related to relatively fine points around tax issues, right? Does this, does this particular activity constitute unrelated business income, right? What are the consequences of my program-related investment, right? Taking these... IRS concepts and applying them to your balance sheet or your profit and loss statement and being able to say, is this or is this not going to destroy my nonprofit status? All right. So that tends to be a little bit more specific. And then the third mate comes up is employment issues related to either um, officers, so the directors and other you know people at the company, or as it relates to the the volunteers and other people that are around. So these are more of your you know HR and employment related issues. You know, can I fire this person? What are discrimination laws? I love that you framed that up for us, because if, if anything, that goes right back to the way we started this conversation and we don't have much time left, but your whole thing about, you know, the law is not magic and that, so I love that you kind of gave us um, that framework with which to understand when we need the attorney, um, when we need the, that, that legal voice. And Jared, I appreciate you bringing out um, that, that notion that just because you have one type of legal expert that does not guarantee that that person is going to be the right fit 
that's right. for your organization in all the questions. I mean, that's, that's a Just pretty like powerful I said, thing. A doctor's a doctor, but I'm not going to a podiatrist to check out my vision. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And a lot of people, a lot of people think a lawyer is a lawyer, but you know, look, I don't know anything about family law. If you need a divorce, do not call me. Um, <laughs> you know. Exactly. But I mean, if you need a company, if you're trying to figure out how to rewrite your bylaws, I'm your guy. Mm-hmm. So, um, you, you know, different weapons for different skills, or however that goes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have been great. Our time has blown by. Um, and for those of you with us today, we did have a little bit of uh, freeze up. Sometimes that happens. And we're going to blame it on your part of the country, Jeffrey, where I it's would. mighty cold today. Um, right. And so we want to make sure that everybody gets um, Jeffrey Glazer's information. And I'm going to um, share that again with you right now. Um, Ogden Glazer, Glazer and Schaefer. Wow, really a great way to help us navigate what why and when we might need some legal guidance um, and understanding it. Jeffrey, I think it was fabulous. Thank you. You know, that these are living, breathing actions and documents and not just to wait until you have a crisis and, sure. and expect for somebody else to clean up your mess. So that was wise, wise advice for us. Um, you can check them out at ogs.law and um, see what's going on. Your website has a lot of really interesting information. You have a pretty robust Mm -hmm. section um, on your blog posts, I noticed. And um, your your practice seems to have a lot of different type of attorneys working in it. And so super cool. We are delighted to have you on. I suspect when we have some sort of other big issue, we might have to rope you back in. Please. Because you touched on something that Jarrett and I have been talking a lot about. And that's the whole employment law issue and all these things that are kind of bubbling up to the surface. And Mm -hmm. so um, we might have to rope you back in for some of that. Happy to come back. (laughs) Hey, Jeff, so refreshing uh, to talk so so candidly and so friendly to an attorney. You know, those are always the best conversations with an attorney. It's yeah, true. friendly attorney, friendly discussions with attorneys don't happen that often. So right. hopefully, you can but they do here on the nonprofit to, show, to the legal counsel. Yes, <laughs> thank you, it. thank you. Awesome. Hey, Jer- Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, has joined me. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, the Nonprofit Nerd Fundraising Academy. The Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Staffing Boutique. And hint, hint, I think we're going to have some new logos up there pretty soon, Jarrett. So we're super excited about that. All of these people come in day in, day out, and they support us. We are now 500 plus episodes strong going into our third year. Um, And so we have a lot more to talk about, a lot more information, and a lot more thought leaders coming our way. Again, we end every episode with this message to stay well so you can do well. 